Miniature Realms is proudly sponsored by Income Gaming, Cheltenham's premier friendly local game store. Check the link in the description. In 2011, Tamokan The Throne of Chaos was released by Forgeworld as a sort of an alternative timeline campaign for Warhammer Fantasy 8th edition at the time. It was penned by Alan Bly based on an original concept and outlined by Rick Priestley. Now, sadly, I don't own a copy of this book and it goes for absolutely crazy money now. I saw a copy recently for over a £1,000 on eBay and it's way beyond my budget just to have on the shelf as a bit of a sort of nostalgic read. But it was packed full of all the Fordwell goodness that you saw at the time. Beautifully presented, loads of beautiful colour images, loads of effort put into it and a bespoke range of resin miniatures for the Warhammer Forge at the time. Along with all those fantastic miniatures were rules for each of them in the game. And of course, one of the most iconic was the Marienburg class land battleship. This is another extremely rare and now expensive item. Very, very hard to find. And I never owned one, but I've always wanted to paint one. Luckily for me, my friend Jordan of the Jordan Sorcery Channel does own one. In fact, I think he owns two. And after a brief discussion, we decided that I was going to paint one for him. Now, I decided to spare you all the building stage of this. There was lots of swearing and lots of wart parts, and it was slightly challenging at times. And the other challenge was going to be using this deadly nightshade that Jordan really wants to include in his army. And there we are. The miniature is all assembled and primed black. And those of you who watch the channel very often will know I like to do underpainting, which most often consists of a zenithal layer using the airbrush and then lots of dry brushing on top. The reason I do that is because I like to paint a lot or at least base coat a lot in glazes using contrast paints, army painters, speed paints, Vallejo Express colour and so on. And then use a much more traditional method afterwards building on those base coats and highlighting and layering more traditionally as you would say. By underpainting in this way you get a little bit of shadow built into the miniature already and you get some highlight so that when you do apply those glaze layers you get a nice effect already far beyond the normal flat base layers you have. It means you can leave some areas but in other areas where you do highlight further it gives you a nice layout and a bit of a template to fill in. I use the same method on the crew as well and I won't focus too heavily on the full painting of the crew otherwise this tutorial would be absolutely massive and I think most people would prefer to focus on the big plush item itself but I will talk through at the end of the video how I handled the crew members. Miniature Realms is proudly sponsored by Baron of Dice, premium wargaming dice. Over 500 styles, over 4,000 customer reviews. Welcome to the best dice on the planet. So there we have it, all underpainted and ready to go. And you can already see where the shadows and the highlights will go. And the same on the crew members there. There are three more out of shot. I'm starting off with Wildwood and Garagat Sewer from Citadel Colour, Hardened Leather and Algae Green from Army Painter Speed Paint. And I'm plopping them in my palette here. And I'm going to thin them all with a touch of water. And I used a similar method for wood on the Trebuchet for a recent Bretonian tutorial. So you, you may well have seen it before. I think I also used it on my Border Prince's Bombard also for those Bretonians. And what I'm doing here is using the four colours and then wet blending them together on the miniature so I swap and change between the colors and allow them to flow together and you get this really nice multi-tone effect that blends into the detail on the miniature so it goes into all that wood grain but you get this really beautiful effect with mixing the different color browns and then the green in there as well and you could change your color palettes you could remove the green if you wanted you could go for blacks if you want more of a blackened kind of wood but I really like this effect and we're gonna have lots of black lining on there lots of metal so this as a wooden color is quite Quite pleasing and I think will work with the overall palette. As you can imagine this is quite a long process because so much of the ship is covered in wood so it's very much a case of working my way around between all the panels and filling in as much as I can making sure I play around with those little variations. Now I am doing my best to stay away from the areas that aren't wood because having that nice underpainted base to work from really helps the later stages in painting. If I do make a mistake and go outside the line so to speak I can touch it up with a little bit of grey or white paint but I am going to do my best to keep 
keep it in there. It's funny enough, it's quite easy to control. These contrast style paints, especially when they're thinned, flow into the edges nicely. It's a little bit easier to do a neater job than you'd think. In many ways, I find it easier to base coat like this and definitely faster than I'd do if I was doing it in a more traditional method here of painting in with a flat brown acrylic. And here's what the ship looks like with just those wooden areas done. There might be the odd little gap here and there, but they're easy to tidy up later on, but quite a pleasing first stage. Next up is model color deck tan, and this is a, a kind of an off whitish color with a green tint to it. But when you dry brush it, it's, it's, it's very much a white color, but not too bright. Now I've been super, super light here. I am hitting an awful lot of the miniature especially around the wheels and then over the areas that will be a dark wood later on so the the panels but i will catch some of the edges on the bits we've already painted but i'm being super super light here i'm using the the newer style and um, dry brushes that are very popular at the moment they are very good if you haven't tried them already give them a go um, but hardly any paint on the brush at all i'm just trying to catch a few of the edges here and just really really pick up just the edges and not streak too flat across now i can tidy anything up and i will be glazing back with more speed paint and contrast later on but I am still trying to take my time and make sure I don't put any really really heavy whitish marks on there. Going over the areas that were already white is also really helpful here because I'm just picking out the rivets and some of the top edges of this other panelling and when we do the next layer which will be a sort of a, a dark black brown it really really helps that show through so you do less highlighting later on. And there's just quite a lot of it to do, as you can see here. You don't want to forget the, the mast as well. And just catching those edges and things and really re-emphasizing some of the areas that have been dulled by that first base layer. Well, now we're using Contrast Black Templar. It's one of the sort of mid blacks you can get in this style. It looks a little bit blue in the pot there, but it's not too opaque and not too dark. So I still want to show some of that white underpaint through and give me that natural highlight there so it makes it a little bit easier later on. I'm just gonna pick out all of the wooden paneling and the cross beams and things as well. Again, this is another big job. So you just take your time working around. You want to make sure that you don't make too many mistakes and, and cover the woodwork you've done already. If you go over anything that's going to be metallic, that doesn't matter at all. It's a nice base for that. So you won't have any issues there. So the main focus is keeping it away from those shields and keeping it away from the woodwork. And this is how we look after that blackened wood stage and already starting to come together here. And then the next stage is more model color. I'm using London gray here. And then this as a dry brush again, I'm working my way around and picking up the detail that's on the miniature and it's absolutely packed full of detail, this miniature. So you can really get in there with the dry brush as long as you're not too thick with the paint. So you end up with streaks, you get a really, really nice effect. And then on to light gray, also from model color. And I'm just picking out some of those top edges and working top to bottom more here and it really just kind of makes those edges pop and adds a little bit of a further dimension to it. Now we return to the glazes and we got contrast skeleton horde and we've got algae green for the skeleton horde I'm just using it almost to need little touch of water for the algae green I have added a little bit more water. What I'm doing here is just going to glaze back in where I feel that any dry brushing is looking a little bit chalky and it just tones it right back down again here. So mostly it's just around the edges because you were focusing on dry brushing all of the wooden panels, the darker wooden panels, but it is fun just to add a little bit of extra color back in and a little bit of variation. And we do more of this later on with, with oil washes as well. But I just think it really, really helps tie it all in and gives it a bit of a tidy up after that. What can be a messy dry brushing stage? So let's start with the metallics now, and this is decayed metal from scale 75 metal and alchemy range. I'm actually being a bit daring here and starting with the airbrush without using any masking, but it was going to take a very long time to paint in all the metal parts. So starting with a base layer and making sure that my overspray is going to be facing away from the wood of the miniature. And I'm happy to report that I didn't have any accidents at this stage when just starting to build up a brown layer first. Then after that, it's all of the metal paneling and there's quite a lot of it. So you've got the metal engines and gears underneath those big back wheels. You've also got these metal supports that go all around the ship and this just takes quite a while. 
Now, as it stands, there are no rules for the Marienburg class landship in Warhammer the Old World, though the 8th edition rules aren't too far away from something that could be converted for friendly games if you should wish to. I know Jordan will definitely be doing that, and I'm sure I would be as well. I'll definitely be happy to play against it for some fun games. It used to be a whopping 300 points. It had a culverin at the front, which has basically worked like a normal cannon at the time. They also had a fuselade attack, which is the idea of the guys with their blood underbuses shooting from the side there were range or 18 strength 4 at the time and armor piercing again that would be pretty easy to convert into the new rules and you could use the rules for the, the new empire great cannon for the culverin i'm sure with those rules, the ship had a whopping 12 wounds and had a 3-up armor save and a 6-up ward save, so it would definitely take some whittling down before you can get it to remove from the table. The ship essentially had two speeds, which was slow, where you could move up to six inches directly forward, or full power when you would roll 2d6, I believe, so you couldn't fully control it at those speeds. The ship caused fear, was unbreakable, and caused D6 impact hits on the charge, which was really, really cool, I'm sure. And of course, being a Warhammer War machine, it had a fantastic land ship calamity chart as well, where the crew could abandon ship, it could go out of control, or even explode. I certainly hope they do bring out rules for this at some point, maybe when the Empire Army arcane journal is released this model will come back to forge world who knows who knows what state the molds and things are in but i'm sure people would buy it if it came out and it would be really really fantastic to see it back so if any of you at the studio are listening even though i'm sure it's already all planned in this would be brilliant to come back and i would definitely purchase one if it did so back to the job in hand and we're just finishing off all of the base layers of the metals now finishing off that decayed metal on the mast here with a few of these supports which i'm guessing are used to climb the mast so the next stage from the same paint range is black metal and if you've watched some of my tutorials before you'll know the deal by now with this i like to use this over the decayed metal the decayed metal is very much a, an undertone for it and it makes the metal look a little bit more aged makes it give it a little bit more depth and a bit more realism to it you could just go straight in with this metallic color if you wanted to and again i was brave and went in with the airbrush first just little bits here and there but it did save a lot of time on the more open areas of the metallics and uh, again i can report i didn't make any messes here and much like the other stages so far it being a big miniature it does take quite a while so it's going around picking out all of the smaller areas that you've painted in the decayed metal and going over them with the black metal you know leaving a little bit of that decay metal showing is absolutely fine that's partly what it's there for but you you do notice the difference and because that's already there you can be a little bit more relaxed and loose with the application of this not worrying about going neatly to the edges as i said leaving that decay metal showing through it just adds to the overall effect and we will be adding a, a further highlight in some areas as well there's also rivets and things to start picking out especially the larger ones at this stage so now to my third part of my favorite metal recipe is Game Air Silver. And I'm using this again, starting with the airbrush, just to highlight. And to start with, I'm leaving both of the previous colors there showing. So we're leaving a bit of that decayed metal and we're leaving a little bit of the black metal in there as well. So you've got that sort of three tone and then we'll really bring that all together with an oil wash a little later on. But when I go around to these smaller areas with the rivets and the, the sort of the under areas, I'm, I'm maybe being a little bit lighter here. I don't want to obliterate those other two colors so i'm just almost using it as an edge highlight in some places just picking out the, the top of a rivet here or there and it really just starts to make the miniature pop moving away from the metallics for a short while now and we are on to contrast agoras dunes and this is perfect for all the barnacles and limpets and whatever it happens to be on the bottom of the hull of the ship they are still underpainted so that kind of gray dry brushed effect that you have on the bottom so they're perfect just to add this agoras dunes layer to it and there's no more that i'll do to it other than some oil washes going on later on and they look perfectly detailed no need to individually pick them out with highlights you've, you've done that already with the underpainting stage and that dry brushing the detail is all prominent so by adding this glaze over the top it's already showing you some shadow and some highlight and things and it just really helps speed the process up we do have this wonderful little starfish and i'm just using a orange contrast paint here as well just to make him stand out a little bit more from all those barnacles now it's time for the pain and the pain is because deadly nightshade is a right pain in there 
Now, Jordan loves Deadly Nightshade and it's part of the theme colour for his army, so we have to use it. And I did look for alternatives, and, and there may well be some out there, but a little Google search didn't bring me any of this is it this is your definitive alternative and I didn't want to mess around and get something that was was just close so I decided to go with it I knew it wasn't the best paint out there it's a, an old formulation it didn't seem to carry over into the the newer Citadel ranges and when you apply it very very thin like this it looks okay but it's very very high in sort of a gel base so the, the the medium of the paint and very very low in pigments so it looks looks really deep in color but as soon as you try to paint it on with any thickness then it, you, you just got no pigment in there at all and it dries all streaky so you have to do it incredibly thin and you think that's fine i'll do a few layers of it and it'll be it'll be absolutely fine and it just goes on and on after eight or nine layers it still doesn't give you a nice smooth coverage and it's, it's really 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 frustrating but I had to find a way of using it and and that's all I had to do really is be is be patient and, and chip away and, and keep on and on. And we got there in the end. And the last thing I want is Jordan to feel bad about that. I've already discussed it with him. Um, but yeah, it is a really, really frustrating paint to work with. At least I found it so. So if you are looking to do something similar, find an alternative that, that's close to it. Maybe avoid the, the, the proper Deadly Nightshade, which is now um, a Cote de Arms paint, who I believe were the original manufacturers of the Citadel range at the time that it existed after what felt like the, the millionth layer of deadly nightshade and it definitely needs some work and the plan was to fix that up with the highlighting stage and just going back with a little bit of white here just to pick out the detail again on the embossment on the shields whether i've gone over with the deadly nightshade or the part of the dry brushing earlier has messed it up or whatever other reason during the early stages because i really want to use contrast again just to kind of get the base layers of all the detail on the shields so the next army colour or spot colour is yellow and I'm going to base coat my yellow with Nasdrag yellow. How many times can I say yellow from contrast as well? And I'm just going to do some different designs over the shields, some halfway, some quarter, that kind of thing. These are a couple of miniatures from Jordan's Army, and these are actually painted by Chris Peach, so Peachy, and we, I think, briefly discussed um, Deadly Nightshade when when we chatted as well. Um, and these are the, the kind of colour schemes that uh, evolved from, from Jordan's original ideas, and Jordan really likes it. I checked with him, these are the colours we want to go with, so we want to go for the red and the blue and the yellow, the blue, sadly, being Deadly Nightshade. Um, and I wanted to carry them over and even bring in that purple and green later on in the miniature as well i think they're going to look really really nice and it's definitely something to break up that blue paint as well for the red i'm basing it with contrast flesh terrors red which is a slightly deeper red than the one i often use for these things which is blood angels but i really wanted to go for the the darker red in this this style make it a little bit dimmer and, and duller i'm still going to highlight afterwards to brighten it up but i think it just really really pops against that blue and against that yellow for the blue, I'm using Contrast again and Luxian Purple. And again, just like the other colours, working my way around, deciding which shield I'm going to add it to. And then this one, I went for a half shield kind of design. To highlight the red, I'm using Mephiston Red and Evil Sun Scarlet. I don't use an awful lot of Citadel paints, but I do like their reds and their yellows, so they're nearly always in my collection. And very, very robust. You know what you get with them. I do use them on the palette as much as possible rather than at the pot even though that's tempting and I just find that they're really really easy to work with and they work well with their contrast range as well as we can see here. For the yellow highlights I stuck with the aforementioned Citadel colour range starting with Avalanche Sunset and moving on to Phalanx Yellow for the top highlight. I do have these on the palette they are thinned with a little touch of water and just blending out towards the highlights around the edges. Um, the, the highlights are sometimes focused towards the top of the shield, sometimes the bottom, depending on what I felt looked best at the time. There's no sort of rhyme or reason to it. I just go by eye really, but it really builds on from that Nasdrag yellow base layer. There's quite a lot of yellow on these, on the detail on these shields, and you could probably paint these gold if you wanted to go for a metallic look. That would look pretty cool as well, but I wanted to stick with a sort of standard colour. They're not really non-metallic metals, but there are some elements of, of highlighting in the way you would if you painted them that way. But I, I wanted them to look as if they were painted wood rather than metallic, and I thought the yellow would just pop a little bit more. 
Then we returned to the problem of the blue, and I mixed in a little bit of Aram and Blue from the Citadel Color Range into the Deadly Nightshade from Coat to Arms. I thought that maybe by mixing another paint in, it would you know, make it a little bit more robust and a little bit easier to control. It did help quite a bit. It didn't solve all of the problems. Um, the problems carried over to the, the other paint, but it was definitely helped a little bit. I added a little bit of water as well and a tiny touch of medium. And I just started to, to kind of highlight the way I had with the other colours, working up a medium tone, having them both on the palette, um, keeping the, the Deadly Nightshade there as well, so I could glaze back in slightly darker areas and just did the best I could really, and, and eventually it looked, it looked okay. The first couple of passes here were a little bit tricky. The The bottom layer seemed to go on quite well, but as soon as I tried to, to sort of thin it out and feather it out and blend a little bit, that's when the, the properties of the paint became a little frustrating again and it got a little bit streaky. So I guess it was just a case of going back and slowly building up the layers. Some looked a little bit better than others. But like anything, if you stick at it, you, it turns out all right in the end. And by the time we got to that sort of final highlight, which was um, probably 60 or 70% Aram and Blue, uh, it looked quite good. And hopefully it's not moved too far away from the idea of the Deadly Nightshades. It was a little bit brighter with the highlights than, than Jordan May wanted. Hopefully not, but it's, it's definitely got a, a base of the Deadly Nightshade and I think it works. For the purple, I'm using a mix of Bold Titanium White from Pro Acryl and Violet from the Scale 75 standard range. I just didn't have many purple or violet paints in my range at all, and this seemed closest to it. I just added a little bit of white to, to slowly build up towards the top highlight. Now it was time to return to the metals and do some finishing touches really, and this is Grease, which is a ready mixed oil paint from Soilworks range from Scale Color or Scale 75. This is more of a sepia tone, probably uh, closer to uh, the old sepia washes that you used to get from, from Citadel, a little bit lighter than your Agrax Earth shades, um, which would also work. The reason I use oil washes is because they, they don't pull the same way. They go into the recesses and when they dry, they look a little bit weathered and things as well. So you actually get a bit of effect in there. They just flow around these nice rivets and things really, really nicely. And then the second benefit of it is they're so easy to clean up afterwards. Whereas if you're using a traditional wash, quite often they stain um, or pool and then you have to go back in with the paint again to, to tidy it up whereas these use a little bit of clean artist white spirit and you can just clean up areas you can just buff it away with a, a q-tip or a, a ear, cotton earbud depending on what part of the world you come from you can use some sponge as well to brush it away which I, I did on some of the larger areas and once you've buffed it away you end up with no tide marks and once it dries it just looks looks really pleasing and really really cool Again, it's quite a lot of the ship to work our way around. You've got the metal rims on the portholes there. You've got metal bits on the anchor. You've got all the metal beading and ribbing on the ship. And it doesn't matter if it runs onto the wood as well. It actually shades the wood quite well. So I used it in a few places on certain planks around the edges of the metal areas and let it flow out into the wood grain. And once it dries, it, it does the job. And it's just so much easier than using something like a, an Agrax Earth shade or a non-oil or something like that here, which would be the, the, the more traditional painting way of doing it. Now I haven't filmed the tidying up stage and the sponge stage with this. I've done it on quite a few of my videos recently and this is not a pure tutorial as such. This is very much a how I paint it. If I did a pure tutorial on it, it would probably be an hour long and I don't think anyone would really want to watch that and I didn't want to split that into two parts. It's another reason why the, the bit coming up on the crew is a, a little bit condensed as well. But if you want to know more about oil washes, quite a lot of my recent tutorials show you how to do it. If you look at the, the, the Bretonian Knight, I show you how to do it on the armor and how to tidy it up. Loads and loads of things. Just ask me in the comments. I'm happy to point you towards some of the videos that I do it with. So with the crew, we return to that same problem with the Deadly Nightshade. And I used a different effect this time around. I actually mixed it in with contrast medium. I'm um, sorry, it's a little bit out of focus here, but that does improve in a moment. But we mixing it in with contrast medium, enabled it to flow quite well. And I used it a bit like a contrast paint going over this underpainted miniature. And I found by doing a couple of layers of it, we got a, a nice deep blue in the recesses. And I just used the, the, the highlights, the natural highlights that you've got from the raised areas, because I'm using this like a glaze. And that seems to do a nice effect. And it was a lot quicker than trying to fight with the blue the way I did on the shields before. Now, this wouldn't have worked for the shield them being flat areas this worked because of all the detail that are on the clothing of these miniatures you can just see it flowing there into the recesses a couple of layers and it just seemed to work 
This is where the video starts sort of speeding up through the stages now. If you watch any of my recent tutorials, you'll see my recipe for skin that I'm using at the moment using all express colors, using dwarf skin and then gloomy violet and, and deep purple. And they're just a really, really nice way of getting a base layer down, which you can do very minimal highlights. And um, again, go and check out some of my recent tutorials. If you are new to the channel, you've not seen them before. If you watch my channel all the time, you'll be well aware of this process by now. I'm probably a little bit bored of hearing me go on about it. For the spot colours on the miniatures, I'm using exactly the same colour combinations that I used on those shields. So that's where we draw from. The only real difference in terms of method on, on any of it is obviously the addition of the skin and the blue, which I did in a different way. The rest of it are all the same combinations of paints and highlighting colours. So we're using Nasdrag yellow here on the feather and returning to the flesh terrors red here for the, the red sash here on the officer. The same looks on purple on the other feather before returning to the red again for this little tie around the knee. And you get the idea here. I'm focusing on the blue as the main color and then using these as spot colors to tie them into the, the army colors, to tie them into the spot colors on the boat to match the schemes that Peachy used in, in, the, in the models that he's already done for Jordan and hopefully make them look a cohesive army. For the vast majority of the leather strapping and belts and things, I use Garagax Sewer. Again, it's something I'm not going to go into full detail and I don't cover the highlights of them at all in this tutorial. These have been covered an awful lot in my, my recent Warhammer the Old World tutorial. So again, if you're interested and you're new to the channel, just drop me a note in the comments and I will give you some examples of some of the other videos which have been covered in. Alternatively, just browse through those videos. There's plenty of tutorials there and they are very much focused on one individual miniature. So you see every single stage and each color used for this big overcoat here this is hardened leather from army painter speed paint the 2.0 range and again i don't show you the highlighting stage for this but i use a model color again with orange brown and then light brown and it's a combination i use many many times in, in recent videos and i'm repeating myself a little bit here but i'm, I'm conscious that uh, as we end this video we move towards the end of this video that i'm not showing you quite as much detail as i did at the start and, and that reason as i said earlier is just to keep the length of it down and it's more of an exploration into how i painted this miniature rather than a full 100 percent step-by-step tutorial Things start to come together as we apply the highlights. Again, you can see me returning to the same reds as I highlighted earlier on. And again with the same yellows. For the skin, I use Vallejo Noctua range, natural flesh and fairy flesh. And they're just a really nice way of highlighting over those express color base layers, the dwarf skin and the gloomy violets and the deep purple. And just find that focusing a little area on the tops of the cheekbones and on the nose and areas like that just really, really helps make them pop. For all the metallic areas, which are guns and helmets and shoulder pads and some breastplates, I'm using exactly the same combination of colors as I did on all the metallic parts on the ship. And we're talking the same layers, so starting with the decayed metal and building up through the black metal and then through the game air silver and then also using the same oil wash the grease color from soil works from scale color and using those in the same method as I did before. So exactly the same as you saw on the earlier part of the ship. Then after a little bit of swearing and fandangling, they are all glued in place on the ship. There are a couple of other final touches like painting the lens on the big telescope at the front. But aside from that, you, you've seen pretty much everything else. I did add a few, little bit of mud effect to the wheels and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. It's not painted to a display standard, it's painted to a gaming standard. Um, the miniature was a little bit old and ropey and warped, so there, there are some slight inconsistencies. I did do all my best to, to get it back into shape with hot water and hair dries and all kinds of things. And I built a lot of resin miniatures in my time, especially forge world stuff. Some really, some of the really old tanks and things that were quite challenging. But this is this was up there in terms of things that were misshapen um, and, and hard to get to an, into alignment. So I did the best I could. I suppose it being wooden and it looking a little bit rickety um, it doesn't hurt too much. I think that kind of works. Uh, I still think the miniature came out quite well in the end. Now Jordan seems pretty happy with the picture, so he's not received the miniature yet. I'm get to give it to him in person when we meet up at Warhammer World towards the end of this month and the month of recording. We're meeting up just before Easter um, on Good Friday for a, for a game. I'm not including this, I don't believe, but uh, I'm looking forward to handing it over, which is good because I really wanna, wouldn't want to have to put this in the post. It might be quite challenging to get it there in one piece. 
please let me know what you think. Um, have you got one of these yourself at home? Or have you got any of the old Forge World miniatures, the really, really big, cool ones that you, you've got around to painting or would like to paint and waiting to do? Any you'd like to get hold of in the future and hoping to come back, let me know in the comments. And if you haven't checked out my other videos and you are new to the channel because this video has taken your eye, please do check them out. There's an awful lot of old world content on there. The vast majority of it is painting tutorial based, but there are some others as well in talking about commenting on the game and things like that and I do a, a podcast and I do a stream as well I've just started doing so lots of content on the channel so if you're into your old world and you all have my fantasy stuff hopefully there's lots to see on the channel if you have enjoyed the video please do give us a like it helps the video be seen by others leave us a comment it all really helps and I love chatting with you guys in the comments if you like to share pictures of your own work and chat even, even more then there is a discord for the channel you can find the link to that in the video description it's a super friendly place over there you can chat about any game system under the sun and I cover many on the channel so please head over I do have a patron for those who are looking to support the channel further and I really really greatly appreciate all the support and, and all the help especially for my existing patrons who are absolutely fantastic bunch and uh, it really keeps me going on the channel. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Take care and I'll catch you soon.